Hello and welcome again to my Physical Science Online Video Lecture Supplement Series. In today's video I'm going to be working through some examples to go with the lecture notes that are prepared for the Chapter 2 which is on kinematics and the, des the uh, description of motion. And so before we begin with that uh, I think it's worth maybe reviewing a few of the important equations that come out of this chapter. Uh, there were a few more this time than the last time. In fact, in the last chapter there was really only one actual equation, which was the density equation. This time there are several. This top one is giving the average speed and it is the distance traveled divided by the time. The uh, distance that an object travels starting from rest under acceleration is given by this equation. D is the distance, A is the acceleration, T is the amount of time for which it accelerates. The assumption is that the object started from rest. If you drop an object, this is an application of that previous equation, the specific acceleration that you have is G, the free fall acceleration, 9.80 meters per second squared. The acceleration can be determined by determining the change in speed divided by the time over which that change occurred. That is the constant acceleration equation. That's also valid for finding an average acceleration in general. The final speed, if you have a constant acceleration, can be determined based on the initial speed v0 plus the acceleration times the time. And finally, if you have an object which is moving in a circular motion, then the centripetal acceleration for that object is the speed squared divided by the radius of the circle about which the object is moving. So with that said, let's proceed to the example. In our first e example, we have a car which drives three kilometers in five minutes. And what we want to know is what is the average speed in meters per second? So recall that to find the average speed, you can use the distance traveled and divide it by the time to travel that distance. So this is from our notes on speed. Uh, distance is the actual path length traveled. In this case, we're told a, a specific distance and then the time we're also told. So in this case, the distance traveled is three kilometers. The time is five minutes. So um, our equation was basically average speed equals distance traveled over time to travel the distance. That's uh, V bar equals D over T. Um, and so what we basically need here is the uh, distance which is traveled. So that would represent this, uh, be represented by this three kilometers. So D is three kilometers. T is five minutes. So we basically can write V is three kilometers divided by five minutes. And so you throw that into your calculator, what you end up getting is 0 0.6 kilometers per minute. Now, the thing is that this example asks specifically for the speed in meters per second. So we need to convert this into meters per second. So if you are watching this because you're an online student, for example, you know that when you take a quiz, the questions are going to typically ask for um, what is the speed in meters per second. So you've got to be able to uh, sort of imagine that the answer says something like the speed is blank uh, meters per second. So you can't just put 0.6 as your answer because that is not the correct answer if we want it in meters per second. So what we got to do is convert from kilometers to meters. So remember that kilo means a thousand. So there's 1,000 meters per one kilometer. Uh, 
And then we have to convert from minutes into seconds. So one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So now we need to do some multiplying and dividing. So you have 0.6 times 1,000. And then that it has to be divided by 60. You can see that the answer is going to be 10. So the answer is that the average speed is about 10 meters per second. So 10 meters per second. So in this little box, we would write 10. So the next example says that the Soviet Luna 1 probe needed 36 hours to get to the moon from the Earth. And it traveled at an average speed of 10,500 kilometers per hour. So what is the distance that it had to travel in order to get from the Earth to the moon? So we have that the average speed is the distance divided by the time. What that basically means is that we can do some rearranging here. Um, so if you have distance over time is equal to average speed, you can then multiply uh, both sides by time. And so you see this side will cancel out. You're left with distance is equal to average speed times time. So that would be 10,500 kilometers per hour and then that's going to be multiplied by 36 hours. So we need to basically multiply these two numbers together 10,500 and that's times 36 that gives you 378,000 miles kilometers excuse me and of course it's possible that we may want to put this answer in meters instead so you can multiply that by a thousand meters per kilometer and end up with 378 million uh, meters so that's how far from the earth to the moon. it turns out by the way that there is slightly more to it than just that number for the distance that the moon is in more or less an elliptical orbit around the earth so the distance is variable, but that is roughly what the correct average distance is. For our next example, we consider a car which is going to drive three blocks to the north, then two blocks to the west, then another block south, and finally two blocks east. And so the question is, how far has the car driven? And also, what is its displacement? So to understand the difference between the how far has it driven and what's the displacement, it's worth looking in our notes again. There's this nice little diagram that shows displacement and distance. So imagine that the car starts here and ends here. Um, the displacement basically is a line that s starts where the car started and ends where the uh, car ends, a single straight line. It has some magnitude, which is essentially the length of this line in this case. And then there's also a direction. So in this case, it's basically northeast. You can be a little more specific by measuring, for example, how far east of north is it? Uh, that is, what angle uh, between the north and the displacement vector. So that's displacement. If you want the distance, then you basically have to measure out how far this path length actually is. So this would be equivalent to looking at the odometer when you started and looking at the odometer when you stopped and seeing how many miles were added to the odometer. Um, assuming, of course, that you don't pull off or anything like that. Even if you do pull off the road, you could still add that to the total distance traveled. Uh, this path length kind of makes it look like you never actually pull off the road though. Um, so distance is just how much is your odometer going to increase by. Displacement is, you could think of it as when you're standing here at your destination, how far away and in which direction are you from where you started from. So one way that we have of doing this is imagining that the car starts somewhere. We'll call it here, for example. 
and what happens is that it goes three blocks to the north. So three blocks to the north maybe looks like one block, two blocks, and then three blocks to the north. Then it says two blocks to the west. So we go one, two to the west. Then it says go a block south, so one south, then two blocks east, one, two. That may look like kind of a silly path to take, but if you imagine this car going in a downtown area where there maybe are lots of one-way streets, this maybe makes some more sense. He's actually trying to get to here. He has to come up here to where the one-way street allows him to go this way. Then he comes down here. Then he can go this way on the other one-way street. So the question is, how far total has he traveled? And then also, what is the displacement? Well, in this case, the displacement would represent the distance and direction from here straight up. Oops, it's hard for me to draw stuff straight on the setup that I've got, but straight up to here. And you can see that in this case, it's two blocks to the north. So displacement in this case is equal to two blocks uh, and then maybe due north. On the other hand, if we wanted to figure out the distance, we could count how many blocks he's traveled. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the distance traveled in this case is equal to eight blocks. Notice that it doesn't have any particular direction because distance is a scalar and therefore there is no direction associated with it. As a continuation of that question, uh, it says, what if each of these blocks is 50 meters long? And let's say that the driver needed 1.5 minutes, 1.0 minutes, 1.0 minutes, and 1.5 minutes to complete each step of the trip described above. So what was the car's average speed and what was the average velocity? All right, so now um, to determine what the average speed was, what we have to do is use uh, that the speed is equal to the distance divided by the time to travel that distance. Since we've already used that equation, I'm not going to go back to the notes to show where this is coming from. So the total distance in this case is eight blocks uh, times 50 meters per block. And the total time in this case is 1.5 minutes plus 1.0 minutes plus 1.0 minutes plus 1.5 minutes. So this, if you multiply 8 by 50, you get 400. So it's 400 meters divided by 1.5 plus 1 is 2.5, plus 1 is 3.5, plus 1.5 is 5. So 5.0 minutes. So the speed in this case is going to be uh, 400 divided by 5, which you can see since 8 times 50 was 400, then 80 times 5 is also 400. So the answer to this must be 80 meters per minute. And then we could even uh, convert this into meters per second by basically multiplying to get rid of the minutes one minute over 60 seconds. And so you end up with 80 divided by 60. So 80 divided by 60 or 8 over 6 will give you the same answer, namely 1 and a third. So with two significant figures, assuming that, that somehow you know that this has two, you put 1.3. So 1.3 
meters per second. All right, so that is the average speed. What about the average um, velocity? Well, to get to the average velocity, what you have to do is that you need to use the displacement rather than the distance. So the average velocity, and you can put a little bar over it to represent an average, is the displacement uh, per unit time. So we've already figured out that the time is five minutes. The displacement in this case is two blocks times 50 meters per block uh, to the north. So that divided by 5.0 minutes. So you know that 2 times 50 is 100. So you would have 100 blocks per 5 minutes. And 100 blocks per 5 minutes uh, is, or excuse me, 100 uh, meters per 5 minutes is also the same thing as uh, as uh, 20 meters per minute. So your average velocity here is 20 meters per minute and then you can convert that again by multiplying through by one minute per 60 seconds. So 20 divided by 60 is a third so you'd end up with 0.33 meters per second. Doggone traffic. All right. Now we ask, uh, going back to this question of the moon orbiting around the Earth, uh, basically the average distance that this moon is going to have from the Earth is 384,000 kilometers. But this distance actually varies because this is an elliptical orbit. So here it's very close to the Earth relative to here where it's farther away. And uh, in fact, the closest to the Earth might be over here. And this point over here is called the perigee. And this point over here that's farthest away is called the apogee. And it turns out that at this farthest point, this apogee, there's a 406,000 kilometer distance between Earth and Moon. And at perigee, it's a 363,000 kilometer distance. And so if for simplicity we take the Earth to be stationary, how far is it from perigee to apogee? So to solve this problem, we can draw um, an, a diagram of the Earth and of the Moon, which is orbiting the Earth. So the Moon is here, and sometime later the Moon is over here. And basically what we've been given are the distances between the Earth and the Moon. And so we're told that this distance right here from shortest distance between Earth and Moon is 363,000 kilometers. And then we're likewise told that this distance from center of Earth to Moon uh, at greatest distance is more like 406,000 kilometers. So the question here ends up being how far apart are they um, from least distance to greatest distance. So this right here would be the magnitude of displacement, which I'm just going to label as x. So magnitude of the moon's displacement we can label as x. And to get x you can add these two numbers together because they are exactly opposed from each other. In other words, this is a straight line from here to here. Uh, along these numbers. And so x in this case is 363,000 kilometers plus 400 
and uh, 6,000 kilometers. So if you add those two numbers together, what you end up getting is that this distance is about 769,000 kilometers, or if you convert it to meters, 769 million meters. So that is the displacement between perigee and apogee for the moon if the Earth is stationary. If the Earth is moving, which it is, then this gets to be a bit more complicated, but I'm not going to try and work that example today. Okay, the other part of this example, or the logical extension of this example, is to ask how far does the moon actually travel in moving from perigee to apogee? In other words, when it moves from here around this path to here, how far does it travel? From here around the path to here. And, and actually, the moon's orbit is more appropriately from here around the path to here. Uh, in any case, you get the same answer. And it turns out that this is not quite so easy a question as it would appear. And the reason for that is that the moon's orbit is not circular. It is elliptical. So from this point traveling around the curve to this point, what you actually have is half of the total perimeter of the ellipse. So you have to know how to find the perimeter of an ellipse. It turns out that that is not so simple. There's a number of different formulas that you can use to approximate it algebraically. One is to use this approximation. Perimeter is approximately 2 pi square root a squared plus b squared over 2, where a is called the semi-major axis. It's the distance from, uh, for example, the perigee to the very center, or from the apogee to the very center. Remember that the Earth is actually at one of the focal points, not at the center of the ellipse. B, on the other hand, is the distance between um, basically center and semi-minor axis. So B is basically the minimum distance across the ellipse. A is the maximum distance across the ellipse. So this formula works reasonably well. It should get you an answer within about 5%. This formula is slightly better in that it, it will be a little more accurate for computing the perimeter. I'm going to go ahead and use the easier formula uh, and call it close enough. So in this problem we have been given uh, basically we're going to use the formula that the distance traveled is one half of the perimeter which means that it is one half of 2 pi square root a squared plus b squared over 2. So you can see that there is a half here and there's a 2 here, so there's a little bit of cancellation. So we have right here the value for the semi-major axis, b. That's given in the problem because it says assume the semi-minor uh, length b is equal to the average earth moon distance. So this is the uh, semi-minor axis length. We need to get the semi-major axis length. So the semi-major axis length is basically like this. So we'll call a to be this distance and also must be equal to this distance. So in other words a is half of the value of that magnitude of displacement that we found in the previous example. So a is equal to one half of x, and so that is equal to one half of 769,000 kilometers. And so if you take 769,000, 769,000, you divide it by two, what you end up with is 384,500.
So the value for x is also very nearly equal to, or the, or the value for a is very nearly equal to this average value. And so that tells us that it's actually a fairly circular ellipse. So that's good because this formula is valid for an ellipse that is very nearly circular. So we have 385, uh, 384,500 kilometers for A. So D is going to be equal to pi times the square root of 384,500 kilometers uh, squared plus 384,000 kilometers squared. And then you also need to over square root two. By the way, uh, excuse me, if we throw everything under the square root sign, then there's an over two here. By the way, one way of checking to make sure this formula makes sense before I plug all the numbers in is to ask, what would happen if this ellipse was turned into exactly a circle? Well, in that case, a and b would be equal. So a squared plus b squared would become, uh, and I'll, I'll write this in black because it's kind of a little bit of an aside, you'd have a squared plus b squared would be equal to a squared plus a squared. So that's 2a squared. So if you have that divided by 2, what do you end up with? Well, the twos cancel here. And if you take a square root of all that, then what you end up with is square root of a squared, which is equal to a. And so you'd be saying half the perimeter is pi times a. Well, a in this case just represents the radius of the circle. So half the perimeter is pi times r. That means that the whole perimeter is two pi times r. And that's what you'd expect for a circle. So that's how you know that this is a reasonably valid approximation. Okay, so let's plug in numbers for what we actually have here. What we actually have here is d is equal to pi times the square root of, and so now we're going to have to take this number that we just found and square it. So we end up with this number. And then to that we're going to need to add another 384,000. And that actually also needs to be squared. So you get a number like this, then you divide it by 2 you get a number like this, and then you take a square root, you get a number like this. 384,250. It's almost exactly the average of 384,000 and 384,500 for what that's worth. So that then needs to be multiplied by pi, and what you get is this number. So now we go back to the question of significant figures. How many significant figures do we have? Well, assuming that all these numbers are just rounded to the nearest thousand, there are three significant figures. So we would need to round this to, um, looking at this number, we would have 1,210,000. So I'm not going to put the, the big number in here. Uh, because there's a lot of digits to write, call it big number. And what the final ends up being is 1,210,000 kilometers. So that is the actual distance traveled as opposed to the um, displacement between one and the other. For our next example, we have a car and the car begins at rest and accelerates to a speed of 20 meters per second in a time of five seconds. And so it wants to know what is the car's average acceleration. So looking in our notes, what acceleration is defined as is uh, basically the change in velocity. And so if you 
speed up, slow down, or change direction, you have an acceleration. And the, the more the change is, the greater the acceleration, or the more the change in the same amount of time, or the faster the change, the quicker the change, whatever you want to call it, the greater the acceleration will be. So acceleration actually is the time rate of change of velocity. So what is the acceleration actually given by? Well, average acceleration is change in velocity divided by time for the change to occur in. So we can also call that change in speed per unit time if the car is moving only in one dimension. In other words, if, as long as there's no turning or direction changes, then uh, it's change in speed per unit time is sufficient. Uh, for velocity, you could also say that if the car is initially moving from left to right, and then suddenly at the end it's moving from right to left, then initially it has a positive velocity and finally it has a negative velocity. So in any case, this right here is the equation that we need in words, and here it is in symbols. So the one that we're actually going to use, the equation we're actually going to use, uh, average acceleration is change in velocity divided by time to make that change. Uh, we basically need this one, final minus initial divided by time. So here is the time, five seconds. This right here is actually the final speed, v final. And since it begins at rest, this is saying that the initial speed is zero. So the average acceleration we can get by taking 20 meters per second minus 0 meters per second and dividing by 5 seconds. So this part is already 0 goes away. 20 divided by 5 is 4. So the average acceleration in this case 4.00 meters per second squared. So that is your average acceleration for the car. Okay, after this happens, the car slows to a speed of 10 meters per second in five seconds. So we wanna know what the average acceleration is for that interval and also what the average acceleration for the entire 10 second motion would be. So we can maybe call the acceleration in the uh, second interval of time uh, the second five seconds, that is, as maybe A2, and the, the one we found before is A1. And then for the entire time, we could call it uh, just A. So how are we going to find each of those? Well, A2, we can get by using the uh, final speed, 10 meters per second, this is V final 2, uh, would be 10.0 meters per second, minus the initial speed in that interval, which is actually 20.0 meters per second, and then we divide the whole thing by 5 seconds. So what do we get for that? Well, we're going to end up with negative 10 meters per second divided by 5 seconds and so that's negative 2.00 meters per second squared. Okay, if we want to find the average for the entire interval, what do we do? Well, you may be tempted to say the average for the entire interval is this plus this divided by 2. And if you were to do that, you'd have 4 minus 2, which is actually a positive 2, then divide that by 2, you'd end up with 1. However, that is not the correct way of doing this. To get the average for the entire interval, you take with the initial speed for the entire interval, so this is v naught, and you end with the final speed for the entire interval and you subtract the two from each other, so you have 10.0 meters per second minus the initial 0, 0.0 meters per second, and then you divide by the amount of time. In this case, you're gonna end up with the same answer, 
And the reason why you end up with the same answer is because this process is basically constant for a while, then constant for another while, and both things happen for the same amount of time. So this is going to end up as 1.00 meters per second squared. However, consider what would have happened if we, for example, allowed the car to slow um, to a speed of 0 meters per second in the second 5 seconds. Uh, but, but instead of making it 5 seconds, maybe we make it 10 seconds. So what would the average have been in that case? Well, then this upper one here would be 4. This one right here would again be negative 2. If you add the two together straight up, you'd get 1. But if you did the whole interval, you start at rest, you end at rest. That means the average actually should be 0. So you have to basically go with what was your initial speed or velocity, what was your final speed or velocity, take the difference, divide by the total time, and that's how you get the total acceleration. All right, our next example shows us a graph. And the graph has position on the y-axis and it has time on the x-axis. And it asks, what are the units which would go with the slope of position versus time? And the answer is, for one thing, don't just look at this graph um, because this is showing a velocity and a distance. To, to find the slope, you always take the rise, you divide by the run. So if the rise is a distance or a position and the run is a time, seconds, then the slope of that has to be distance or meters divided by time, seconds, so the slope would be meters per second. On a similar uh, vein, if you want to have velocity or speed on this axis and time on the x-axis, then the slope is going to be meters per second divided by seconds, which would be meters per second squared. So notice what these units correspond to. The slope of distance versus time was meters per second. Well, that's the unit that goes with speed. The slope of speed versus time was meters per second squared. That's the unit that goes with acceleration. So that means that the slope of distance versus time graph is actually telling you something about how fast the object is traveling. The slope of speed versus time graph is telling you something about the object's acceleration. So now let's consider another example. This time we drop a ball from the roof of a building and we try to measure the speed every half second on the way down. So initially it has a speed of zero because it's being dropped and then after the first half second it's going at 4.9 meters per second after the next half second it's at 9.8 meters per second and after the next half second 14.7 meters per second so the question is how fast will the speed be after two seconds well remember what I just said on the previous example about slopes here slope of position versus time gives speed or velocity, slope of speed versus time gives magnitude of the acceleration. So one thing we could do here, since we have three different numbers to work with, is make a little graph of these. So step one is going to be make a graph. Now I can sketch a graph here, but I think it would be better to make this graph on some graph paper or using a graphing program. So um, let's go ahead and do it using some graph paper. So here's our graph paper. We're going to need to uh, basically come up with a scale to go with this graph. So this uh, graph could be basically a uh, speed versus time for a ball for dropped 
uh, ball. So this axis right here would be the speed in meters per second. This is the time in seconds. So every half second, so one half, two halves, three halves, four halves would be off. So maybe the half seconds could be these increments. So 1.0 seconds, this one right here would be 2.0 and so on. And then along this axis, we need to have these uh, distances. So 5, 10, 15, for example, 5.0 or 5, 10 and 15. And so at half a second, we're basically at five. At uh, one second, we're just a little shy of 10. At 1.5 seconds, we're just a little more shy of 15. And what you would do here is then you'd need to make a uh, line of best fit for this. I don't have a way of putting a ruler out to do that. Once we've drawn our line of best fit, we have to pick a couple points uh, that are on the line of best fit and just from eyeballing it uh, there might be a point like zero zero and then up here maybe there's a point like uh, whatever is halfway between these 1.75 seconds comma 17.5 uh, meters per second or whatever and so you'd go slope which we represent with an M, is rise over run. So that's 17.5 meters per second minus zero meters per second divided by 1.75 meters per second minus zero, uh, excuse me, this is just seconds, minus zero seconds. So you'd have 17.5 meters per second over 1.75 seconds or 10 meters per second squared. So that's giving you the acceleration. Now, I'm limited here by the piece of graph paper that I'm using and by my ability to draw a straight line without actually being able to use a ruler on my screen. Um, so the next best thing to do would be to make this line up in Excel. Turns out if you did that, what you'll find is that the slope is actually 9.8 meters per second squared, which, in, which not coincidentally happens to be the free fall acceleration. So this is within about 2%. So the actual slope um, in this case is 9.8 meters per second squared. So that corresponds uh, uh, to the acceleration. And so the equation that we would use then, V is equal to V naught plus A times T. That's one of the equations we reviewed at the very beginning of this video. It's dropped from rest and it also says initially it has a speed of zero meters per second. So V is equal to a times t, that's 9.8 meters per second squared, times the time, which is 2.0 seconds. If you multiply those together, you get v equals 19.6 meters per second squared. If you, um, if you tried to predict that from the line that I drew, you'd end up with 20 meters per second squared. That's not too horribly far off. So for our next example, we drop a golf ball from a helicopter, kind of like this guy's doing. And the helicopter is 49 meters above the ground. And so the question is, how long does it take for the ball to reach the ground, assuming that there's minimal air resistance? So this basically is going to make use of the fact that when you have an object which is falling, it has a constant acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. That's assuming that you're falling near the surface of the earth with negligible air resistance. Uh, 
And so basically the object speeds up, speeds up, speeds up. Also means it travels a greater distance for each second um, that it falls. And so the distance that a dropped object travels is given by d equals one half gt squared. That means distance is half of that 9.8 meters per second squared free fall acceleration times whatever time it falls for squared. So we're using, we're making use of this equation right here. Distance is one half free fall acceleration times time squared. Or in other words, d is equal to one half of g t squared. The thing that we're trying to solve for, how long does it take for the ball to reach the ground? That is actually t. Um, this thing is 49 meters above the ground, so that is our value for d. And of course, g is 9.8 meters per second squared is the free fall acceleration. So we want to find the time. That means we've got to rearrange this equation. So if you have 1 half g t squared is equal to d, you can divide both sides of that by 1 half of g. And what that gives you is that t squared is equal to 2d over g. So to get rid of the t squared, we take a square root of both sides. And what you're left with is that t is equal to square root 2d over g. So now we can plug some numbers in. The time is going to be 2 times 49 meters divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. So that means that the time is going to be given by, let's, let's go ahead and get our calculator out. So we have 2 times 49, it's going to be 98, divided by 9.8 should give us 10. So now we take the square root of that, uh, which is here, and that gives us 3.162 seconds. So we'll call it 3.2 seconds because there's two significant figures given up here for D. So because D was given as 49 meters, T is approximately 3.2 seconds. So the follow-up question for that is, what is the speed of the ball in the above example just before impact? So how fast is it going right before it hits the ground? Well, this is basically the same question that we had earlier about the rock being dropped from a certain height and then figuring out how fast it is after two seconds. Now we're figuring out how fast does this thing travel after 3.2 seconds. And it turns out the acceleration is even the same. So for this next example, how fast, we use V final is V initial plus AT. And again, it's being dropped. So uh, we're saying this is zero uh, because that's what happens when you drop something. Uh, dropped means the initial speed is zero. T we saw for over here was 3.2 seconds. And so the final speed is 9.8 meters per second squared times 3.2 seconds. So let's pull open the calculator. Since this is the time from before, we can just multiply this by 9.8. And what you end up getting is 30.99, which rounds off to 31. So that means that the final speed right before hitting the ground is about 31 meters per second. So there's the answer to the second, there's the answer to the first of those pair of examples. That brings me to um, another pair of examples. This one also makes use of the free fall acceleration and what we have here is a bullet being shot straight into the air.
This is not exactly straight in the air. Maybe if it was pointed vertically, it'd be straight in the air. Um, in any case, it's being shot straight up into the air with an initial speed of 294 meters per second. The question is, how high is this bullet going to go before stopping? And then how much time does it take to get to that height? And how much time before it hits the ground? So that's quite a few questions. This is a fairly complex looking example. And so there are several steps in order to solve it. Um, it kind of hinges around the following points. Uh, first of all, the acceleration is, in this case, the gravitational acceleration or freefall acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so that's stated. This right here represents the initial speed. So this would be V naught. And so we can use um, an equation that looks something like this. Uh, distance to get to top is equal to uh, one half of the free fall acceleration times the time squared uh, minus the initial speed times the time. It's actually a plus here, but, but in reality this is a negative acceleration. So that's one way of solving it. Uh, the trick is that you got to know something about the time. And the time is given by basically solving for when is it that the speed, the final speed is zero. Because the speed at any given time, the final speed, is the initial speed plus the acceleration times time. So if we take for this thing right here to be zero, then we can get the time that it takes to get to the top. And so t, rearranging this equation, is v naught over g. And, excuse me, it's negative v naught over g. So that would be negative 294 meters per second divided by negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So uh, pull up the calculator. Since there's two minuses, I'm not going to bother with the signs because they cancel. So 294 divided by 9.8 gives us 30. So this is saying that the time to get to the top is 30 seconds. Uh, so that's 30 seconds to get to top. That actually answers part B. So part A then we would need to plug in the 30 seconds here and so you'd end up with D is equal to one half of, uh, of uh, negative 9.8 meters per second squared times 30 seconds plus 294 meters per second, this part squared, huh? times 30 seconds. So let's plug those guys in. So we had 30, we'll go ahead and square it, we'll multiply it by 9.8, make sure that's a negative, and then we multiply that by a half, so um, divided by 2. So for this first part, we'd have D is equal to negative 4,410 meters, and then to that we're going to add um, so plus, and we'll go ahead and put this in parentheses, 30 times 294. So that's 8,820. And if we add them, you get 4,410. So 8,820 meters, when you add them, 4,410 meters. That's how high up this thing is going to go. So that leaves us with one question. How much time until this guy hits the ground? Well, um, it takes it 30 seconds to get to the top. It turns out it's going to take it another 30 seconds to get to the bottom. But we can show that without having to um, 
to just state, oh, it's going to take the same amount of time because we have our equation here. So this equation basically says d is equal to 1 half g t squared uh, plus v0 t. And what we're going to do here is we're going to say on the way down, this part is 0 because it reaches the top, it stops, then it comes down. And so we have 4,410 meters is equal to one half of, in this case, the acceleration is in the same direction as the thing is traveling. So we have plus 9.8 meters per second squared times time squared. And so the time squared in this case, 4,410 meters uh, times two, because we're dividing by a half, divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. So the time squared, uh, if we pull open the calculator, so we need to multiply by 2, we need to divide by 9.8, you get 900. If you take a square root of that, you get 30. So time squared was 900 seconds squared time is 30 seconds. So 30 seconds to get to top, 30 seconds to get back to bottom. Total time in air therefore is 30 plus 30 or 60 seconds. And so that answers everything on that example. What we've done here is essentially make use of this fact that you have an object which is initially moving that is the bullet has an initial upward velocity and it has a uniform acceleration and so in order to figure out how far the bullet travels in a given amount of time what we do is we combine the equation for distance traveled uh, versus time with constant speed and we combine that with the distance versus time for constant acceleration that started at rest, in other words, starting with a zero speed. And so that combination gives you that the distance is one half of the acceleration times the time squared plus the initial speed times the time. So a follow-up question to that is uh, to ask what the velocity and what the position of the bullet is going to be 10 seconds after being shot from the gun. Now you know that at 10 seconds after being shot from the gun, it hasn't traveled for the 30 seconds it takes to get to the top of the uh, motion. So what that means is that the velocity is going to be in the upward direction at that point. So let's figure out what the actual magnitude of the velocity is. That is, how fast is it going? What is its speed? And then we can also figure out how high above the uh, position of the pistol this bullet is. So again, we're going to be making use of this equation that, that finds the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time, bearing in mind that because the initial velocity and the acceleration are in opposite directions, if this is positive, then this has to be negative and vice versa. So basically what we have is that the final speed is equal to the initial speed plus the acceleration times time. That is the initial speed plus gravitational acceleration times time. And so that's 294 meters per second plus, again, they're in opposite directions. So this is actually a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, times 10.0 seconds. So this quantity right here is negative 98 meters per second squared. And so your final speed, or your final, the uh, magnitude of your speed is basically going to be 294 minus 98 in meters per second. So you can see that 294 minus 98 is going to be uh, just shy of 100. Uh, assuming it's going to be just shy of 200, so it'll be 196 by the time all is said and done. So 
this is 196 meters per second and if we want direction it's traveling uh, whoops it's not a very well written word traveling traveling up okay so that solves for the velocity v final the position that we're looking for we could call x final or, or d final and we make use again of that equation that combines an initial velocity with an acceleration that is we're making use now of this equation, d equals 1 half at squared plus v naught t. Again, because this and this are in opposite directions, this gets a negative sign with it. So we have uh, d is equal to 1 half at squared plus v naught t. And so that's 1 half of negative 9.8 meters per second squared times the time in this case 10 seconds squared and then this is negative note and then to that we add 294 meters per second the initial speed times the time 10 seconds so this quantity right here is 2940 uh, meters per second times seconds, so 2,940 meters. This quantity right here, we'd have half of negative 9.8 is negative 4.9. Okay, that times 10 times 10. So 4.9 times 10 is 49, times another 10 is 490. So we have negative 490 meters here. So the total distance is going to be this um, uh, 490 negative plus 2,910. So you get 2,420. So the total distance is 2,420 meters. So that is how far above, and this right here is how fast it's traveling at this point in time. All right, so this next set of four examples all pertain to what's called centripetal acceleration or circular motion, uniform circular motion. So this first one uh, asks that you have a car which is capable of getting a 4.0 meter per second squared turning acceleration. In other words, the centripetal acceleration is 4.0 meters per second squared. So the question is, what's the maximum speed with which this car can handle a semicircular corner of radius 100 meters? So in other words, while it travels around the corner, it has to be in uniform circular motion and the radius of the circle that it's on is 100 meters. So acceleration in a uniform circular motion basically is there because the car's speed is not changing, but the direction is changing. And if there's a directional change, then there's an acceleration. And in this case, the acceleration is at right angle to whatever the velocity is while it's accelerating. So there's a change in the velocity, there's a change therefore in the acceleration's direction. So in the case of a car going around a corner, that acceleration is thanks to friction between tires and the road for the most part. And you can see here the velocity is this way, it's basically tangent to the circle, the acceleration is radial. Here it's tangent to the circle, the acceleration is radial. Velocity is tangent to the circle, Acceleration is radial. They're perpendicular in all these cases. The equation that we actually want to use to do this is that the centripetal acceleration is the speed squared divided by the radius of the circle. So as long as you have an object moving on a constant radius circle with a constant speed, then it will have a constant magnitude of acceleration.
Notice that that's not the same thing as a constant acceleration because the direction of acceleration is changing just as the direction of the velocity is changing. Um, but this magnitude of acceleration is the speed squared divided by the circle radius. So to return to the question that was asked here, uh, you have a car's tires. It's capable of allowing a maximum turning acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. So this is basically the centripetal acceleration. Again, we're using centripetal acceleration is speed squared divided by radius. It wants to know what is the maximum speed, that would be the V, with which this car can handle a semicircular corner of radius R, 100 meters. So we can rearrange this equation. V squared is equal to A times R. The, the speed squared is the centripetal acceleration times the radius. And so that also means that the speed is the square root of the centripetal acceleration times the radius. So we have that the speed is the square root of 4.0 meters per second squared times 100 meters. And so this is the square root of 400 meters per second squared, uh, meters squared per second squared, excuse me. And if you take the square root of 400, well, 20 times 20 is 400, because that's the same thing as having 2 times 2, which the square root of that is 2, times 10 times 10, and the square root of that is 10. So 2 times 10 is 20. So we get a speed of 20 meters per second. That's the maximum speed that this car can handle this turn. The immediate follow-up question is, how does the answer to the above question change if the corner is made sharper? In other words, if it's a 50 meter circle that this car is on rather than a 100 meter circle. All right, so maybe we call all of this A1. So if we want the new value, uh, so this one right here, the, the old value was for R1, the new value R2 is 50 meters, and so now we want to know, um, again, AC is 4 meters per second squared. What is the new speed? Well, again, we can, uh, all of this stuff stays the same, so we can still use V as A times R, square rooted. And so now we have square root of 4.0 meters per second squared times uh, 50 meters. So now V is going to be the square root of, if you do this multiplication, 200 meters squared per second squared. So that gives you 10 uh, times the square root of 2. And so if you plug this into your calculator, in other words, you'll get V is approximately equal to 14 meters per second. So this gives you some idea of where, when you're driving on the road, you'll see those occasional caution signs. Uh, and it'll be like this nice yellow caution sign. And it'll have some speed limit on it, uh, you know, 20 miles per hour turn. They basically are doing some calculation like this to figure out what the recommended speed around that corner is going to be. And they take into consideration what um, what condition, or what kind of acceleration can you expect to get from your tires. And in fact, there's other factors such as the fact that the corner on the road might be a little bit banked, etc. But this this is the basic calculation that they end up doing to figure out what should the recommended speed end up being. All right, opposite question, and this maybe is the kind of question that you ask um, if you go to a NASCAR race, for example. And this maybe is a little slow for NASCAR, but uh, same principle. Suppose that you know what the radius of your uh, circle is going to be and you know what kind of speed you want that car to be able to handle the circle at, uh, 
The question is, what kind of tire acceleration are you going to need in order to be able to do that? So how do you design your tires? Or what design constraint does this place on your tires? So even though this is sort of the opposite kind of question from what the previous pair were asking, you're actually still using the same principle. That is that the centripetal acceleration is the speed squared divided by the radius of the circle that you're trying to move around. So we actually are going to use the same equation. It's just going to be rearranged from the form we were using it in before. And in fact, the question it's asking us is what's the acceleration? So this is the form we want the equation to be in. So basically what you have here is this right here is the equivalent to the radius. This right here is the acceleration. This right here is the speed. Now the tricky thing here is that if we want to have the acceleration in useful units, like say meters per second squared, then we're going to have to convert the speed into meters per second. So convert to meters per second. So to do that we have that the speed is 60.0 miles per hour. And now we need to convert from miles per hour to meters per second. So let's do the miles part first. There's 5,280 feet per one mile. And then there's 12 inches per one foot. There's 2.54 centimeters per one inch. And then there is one meter per 100 centimeters. So we need to plug all those guys in. Uh, and actually you could do all this as one step, it's just I'm gonna run out of space to write on, uh, running across here. But you could also then multiply by the minutes and the seconds to get to the right units. So we're gonna do it in two steps just because of space constraints. So we have 60 times 5,280 times 12 times 2.54 and then that is divided by 100. So you end up with 96,560.64. So maybe we'll call this 960, excuse me, 96,600. So 96,600 meters per hour. So now we need to convert that into meters per second. So 96,600 meters per hour times, uh, we've got to get rid of the hours. So we have hours per 60 minutes. And then we have one minute uh, per 60 seconds. So now we basically get to divide this guy by 60 twice. So divided by 60 and then divided by 60 again and what's left is 26.8 uh, meters per second. So 60 miles per hour is 26.8 roughly meters per second. Okay, so now our centripetal acceleration, therefore, now that we've made this conversion factor, we can plug it in up here. And so what we end up with is 26.8 meters per second. We have to square that, and then we're going to divide by 100 meters. And so this means that our centripetal acceleration, the, the required centripetal acceleration, is this number squared divided by 100. And that is 7.1944. So we would call this maybe 7.19 meters per second squared. So that's what our required centripetal acceleration is in order to handle this curve at this speed. The second part of this question then asks, uh, how large of a semicircular corner 
can this car handle, assuming that it has the same um, tires that we just designed, but now it's only moving at 30 miles per hour. So same equation, different form. So again, we can use that the centripetal acceleration is the speed squared divided by the radius. Now we want to solve for the radius. So radius times centripetal acceleration is speed squared. That means that the radius is the speed squared divided by the centripetal acceleration. Again, what we need to do is get the speed from 30 miles per hour into meters per second. So you can go through this whole big long conversion again, but I've already got that 60 miles per hour is 26.8 meters per second. This is 30 miles per hour, so that's half as much this. So the conversion should be half as much as this, which would be about 13.4 meters per second. So now we would have 13.4 meters per second squared and then that's being divided by 7.19 meters per second squared. So again, where I got the speed from is that in the previous problem, we uh, have that uh, if V is equal to 60 miles per hour, that's also equal to 26.8 meters per second. So if we divide this by 2 to get 30 miles per hour, we can divide this by 2 to get 13.4 meters per second. Okay, so with that little aside, let's open our calculator up. Um, since this is in the denominator, I can actually push this button, and that has now taken 1 divided by this. So now we just have to multiply by the 13.4 squared and you end up with 24.95 so basically means that this radius is approximately 25.0 meters note that this radius is one quarter of the radius that we could handle when we were going at 60 miles per hour so that means that for every time that you double the speed, you have to make the uh, radius that you're trying to travel around four times as big in order to safely handle that radius. So that tells you something about whether it's a good idea to speed or not around those sharp corners or any corner really when driving on the road. It's really not a good idea because the the effect of your speed is not just linear with the effect of the radius that you can handle, but is in fact, uh, you know, for every factor two, you have to have four times bigger uh, corner radius. So for a very sharp corner, you've got to reduce your speed by, you know, quite a bit, maybe by a factor of two to handle a, a corner that's half as sharp. But if you decide to speed over the recommended, then you're sort of asking for a much uh, more gradual curve than is actually there. I want to conclude by taking a look at a couple of examples that have to do with projectile motion. So we'll start with this one, which is example 220, which is of a howitzer. So here's a picture of the howitzer firing. And the howitzer launches an artillery shell at a speed of 256 meters per second at an initial angle of 60 degrees above the horizontal. And the question asks, what are the initial vertical and horizontal components of the speed? So to answer this question, I wanted to talk a little bit about projectile motion and basically uh, why we care about these components of speed. Um, what a projectile is, is any object which has been thrown or launched or lobbed or shot or what have you, uh, such that it has an initial horizontal speed and then now is in free fall. Uh, 
So there's an acceleration in the vertical direction. There is some initial speed in the horizontal direction, whether or not there is some initial speed in the vertical direction. And so basically what happens is uh, you end up with a motion that has horizontal and vertical components to it. In other words, you now have a 2D motion. And what I'm showing here in this diagram is basically a multi-flash uh, photo of two balls, one of which is initially thrown in the horizontal direction and the other of which is simply dropped. And what you see is that the one that's in the horizontal direction continues to move in the horizontal direction. In other words, if you measure how far away, maybe you have like a, a marker standing here or a, a marker marking this position horizontally, you can see that the ball gets farther and farther away from this uh, line as time passes. So it's initially thrown here. After a little time, it's this far away, this far away, this far away, this far away, and so on. And at the same time as this is happening, both balls are falling. And as they fall, basically you end up with uh, noting that these two positions, the vertical position of both balls is the same in both cases. Here one of the vertical positions is actually kind of covered up and so you, there's one fewer dot here than here only because it's covered up in this photo. Uh, other than that little thing you should notice that for example this ball and this ball are at the same height. This one and this one same height. This one and this one same height this one and this one, same height, this and this, same height, and so on. So at all times, these two have the same height because at all times, their vertical component of their velocity is the same. Initially, this was thrown horizontally, so it has zero uh, vertical velocity. This one was dropped initially, zero vertical velocity. And so basically you can treat this as uh, two coupled motions in a sense. That is one motion is vertical, the other is horizontal. And to do that you basically need to break up the motion into an initial horizontal and an initial vertical. And then you also need to know what the acceleration is, horizontal and vertical. In this case, because the ball is in free fall once released, the acceleration is entirely vertical. And so it has g equals 9.8 meters per second squared straight down for the acceleration. Here there's zero speed. After a little bit of time, it started to move, it started to move, it started to move. And so in the vertical direction, they both have the same speed always. In the horizontal direction, this one just has zero speed, and that's why it falls straight down. This one has whatever speed you initially threw it at, and so it kind of describes a parabola as it falls. So there's another picture that kind of shows the same thing going on. Here's a baseball that's being thrown. Here's a baseball that's being dropped. They're always at the same height, even as this one sort of travels uh, horizontally away from where it was dropped. And uh, basically, you can project it straight forward, but you can also project at some angle. So straight forward would be like having an angle theta equals zero. Throwing it straight up is like having an angle theta equals 90 degrees. Uh, straight up is the simple one-dimensional case that we've been doing. Thrown straight forward is a maybe the simplest version of a two-dimensional motion. The initial speed is entirely in the horizontal direction, or the, the initial velocity is entirely in the horizontal direction. But you can also throw, and normally you do throw, or launch, or fire, or what have you, at some oblique angle. And so what that means is that there is a vertical component and a horizontal component to the velocity initially. And so in the vertical uh, direction, what basically happens is it goes up, 
then it comes back down. It's kind of drawn as if it moves over. That's only just to show that there are in fact an upward and then a downward part. You'll notice that the speed, or, or in other words, the uh, vertical component of velocity has equal magnitude at each point in time, but opposite direction. So at the top it's zero, everywhere else, you know, up has this much, down has this much, they're equal length vectors, they're just pointing in opposite directions and so on. The horizontal component is not changing as this thing moves. So that horizontal component is often represented by an X, the vertical is often represented by a Y, and the entire motion can be treated as a combination of the vertical component and the horizontal component. And if you want to get the range, that is basically how far away from where the object is launched will it land, the range can be determined by taking this horizontal speed and multiplying by the amount of time that the object is in the air. And that time you get from the vertical part of the motion. So that's basically a primer on why it is that we care about breaking this up into horizontal and vertical uh, motion. So here's a picture of the entire motion put together of, for example, a football. Notice that the football is not thrown horizontally entirely. It's thrown at some initial angle. It has an upward and an onward component. In other words, a vertical and a horizontal component. And as the football goes up, the vertical component gets smaller until it reaches zero. Then it gets bigger, but in the opposite direction, downward, until the guy catches it. And the horizontal component basically stays constant, that is, neglecting air resistance. So how do you find the velocity components? Well, uh, basically what you do is you want to break into an x part and a y part. And you can do that by using the magnitude and direction of the vector that you're trying to break up, in this case of the velocity vector. So the magnitude of the velocity vector just is the speed. The direction is usually specified by your angle with respect to the horizontal. So for example, if I launch an object initially, uh, maybe the initial uh, launch point is here and it's at a 60 degree angle with respect to the horizontal. That's basically saying, here's your horizontal this angle right here is 60.0 degrees, and this velocity has a magnitude of 256 meters per second. So this right here would represent, for example, V naught. So this is equals V naught. Well, you can break it up into components there's going to be essentially a horizontal component to the motion which parallels the horizon v zero x and then there's also going to be a vertical component which is 90 degrees with respect to the horizon straight up oops i drew it actually a little too long if i'm drawing this more or less to scale your vertical component is about like this v zero y and it turns out that this vertical component we can uh, sort of transpose over here like so horizontal component i guess i also drew a little bit too long should have ended right where this is so the horizontal component would end up uh, right here and so this makes a right triangle. You can see that this right here is a right angle, 90 degrees. And this right here is equivalent to V0Y. So for any right triangle, in general, if you have a right triangle, you can use the identity SOCA TOA. So 
this right here is the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse. Here's your angle theta. Here's your right angle. This is the side that is opposite to the right angle. This is the side which is adjacent to the right angle. So you are using so ka toa. And basically what it stands for is this one says sine of theta is opposite divided by hypotenuse. This one is saying that cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. And this last one is saying that the tangent of theta is the opposite over the adjacent. So basically, uh, the length of the opposite side over the length of the adjacent side is the tangent of this angle. The length of the adjacent divided by the length of the hypotenuse is the cosine of the angle, and so on. Well, those lengths can also correspond to, for example, speeds or magnitudes. And so what this thing is basically saying is that the sine of theta, looking over here, would be this one, V0Y divided by V0. And so what that basically means is that V0Y is going to be V0 times the sine of theta. In other words, the initial Y component is the initial speed times the sine of theta. And in the X component, we have the cosine. So cosine of theta is adjacent, that's V0x, the initial speed in the x direction, the initial horizontal component, in other words, of the velocity, divided by the hypotenuse, which is V0. And so what that's implying is that if you want to get the initial speed in the x direction, then you need the initial speed times the cosine of theta. So uh, basically, to recap, we're basically using trigonometry, using this mnemonic that hopefully all of you have learned at some point, and noting that the hypotenuse, the opposite, and the adjacent correspond to some speeds here. Vertical, here, here's your angle, here's your right angle, therefore this is the hypotenuse, the total speed or the total magnitude of the velocity. Horizontal component is Vx, vertical component is Vy. This is true at any time, be it initial or some later time. So you end up with these two equations. If you care about the initial speed, then you can append a zero to each of these to represent the initial speed. So now we're ready to actually plug numbers in and solve the problem. So what we have is that the initial y component uh, is going to be given by v0y is equal to v0, which is given up here, 256 meters per second, times the sine of theta. So that's the sine of 60 degrees, because this right here is your value for theta. And probably, actually, if, if we're being really rigorous here, this should be called theta naught. And so this is basically sine of theta naught. And similarly over here, this is theta naught. This is theta naught. And so this right here is actually theta naught. In any case, what you can do at this point is open the calculator. And the way that you put this into the calculator that I'm using is you put in 256 times, and in order to do signs on these calculators on the computer, you basically enter the angle that you want to take the sine of, and then you push sine. And so we get 221.7 meters per second. Since we had three significant figures to work with, that basically means that the uh, initial speed in the y direction, v0y, 
is about 222 meters per second. In other words, we got to round off to three significant figures. So in the x uh, direction, we do similar. So v0x is 256 meters per second uh, times the cosine of 60.0 degrees. Now the cosine of 60 is actually a half, but if you don't happen to have that memorized, for example, you've forgotten the unit circle and how it works, you can, of course, pull open the calculator and do it. So there it is, cosine of 60 is a half. That times 256 is 128. So your x component, V0x, is equal to 128 meters per second. Now, I haven't in these videos done much to emphasize the idea of double checking uh, your work, but it is a good idea to do so. One way that you can double check this particular problem is as follows. You have a right triangle here, and you know that for a right triangle, the Pythagorean theorem says basically, uh, let's say that this is H, this is O, and this is A. Well, Pythagorean theorem would say that H squared is A squared plus O squared. So as applied to this problem, that's saying that V naught squared should be V zero Y squared plus V zero X squared. So V zero is the square root of those two, V zero Y squared plus V zero X squared. So again, this is to do our double check. So 128, if you square it, you get this number. We got to add to that our um, 222 meters per second. So 22, it's actually 221.07, some such thing. So we just added them together. Now you take a square root. Oops. Um, Let's try that again. I didn't square the 221.07. So if you square that, you get this. Then to that, you're going to add 128. If you square that, you get this. Add them together, you get 65,255. Take a square root, and you see it's 255.45. Very, very close to 256, which is what we expect it to be. The, the difference is basically round off error. And in fact, if I take the calculator and redo this by putting in uh, 60, taking the sign of that, multiplying by 256, okay, then square that. So I appear to have transposed my zero and my seven before. Uh, in any case, you square that, you get 49,152. You add to that 128 squared, you get this number, you take a square root, and you get 256. So our double check says that this in fact is correct. These two numbers do in fact work as a pair for V naught equals 256 meters per second. All right, so our second example for projectile motion is this example 2.21. And this time it basically says that you have a bullet, it's being fired with an initial speed of 200 meters per second, it's being aimed more or less upwards at an angle of 30 degrees, uh, presumably it's 30 degrees above the horizontal. And so it asks us how much time is the bullet going to spin in the air, what is its maximum height, and how far away will it land? neglecting air resistance. So you could in fact answer this question just by using the kinematics principles that I've so far outlined. But um, basically what you do is you try to solve for the total time by using the vertical component using your 1D kinematics equation. So your first step would be to solve for the time. 
using basically this equation. A in this case <coughs> is the vertical component of the acceleration because the acceleration is entirely downward. So you'd use g equals 9.8 meters per second squared. And you'd have to figure out what your initial and final components of velocity in the vertical direction are. So the initial one you'd solve for by using the sine of theta times the initial speed. The final one you'd end up using the speed of zero because that's what the speed is for an object at the very top of its motion in the vertical direction. And so you could solve for time that way. And then if you double that, that gets you how much total time it spends in the air. If you multiply that time that you solve for by the speed, then in the horizontal direction, then what you get is the range. And if you multiply the time that it spends going upward by uh, half of the acceleration uh, and, and square the time, and then add the v zero part, you get the the uh, vertical thing. In other words, in other words, your first step is break it up into vertical and horizontal components for the velocity, then solve for the time using the vertical component using that the that the uh, final speed at the top in the vertical direction is zero, and then double that time, and you've got the total amount of time. So if you take the time it takes to get to the top and you multiply, uh, use this equation, you can get the maximum height. And if you take the time that it takes to get to the top and back and multiply by the speed in the x direction, then you get the range. So those are all the basic steps for that. But instead of having to go through all those steps, you actually have this set of equations that give you the range and maximum height and also uh, total time in the air just from initial conditions like what's the initial speed, what was the initial angle that it was launched at, and what's the free fall acceleration. So we can just make use of these three equations to solve the question. So if you want to know the total time, uh, we could call that time uh, t total or t tote or whatever and the answer is 2 times the initial speed times the sine of the initial angle divided by the free fall acceleration. So this right here represents the initial angle. This right here represents the initial speed uh, v naught and of course the free fall acceleration is given by g is equal to uh, 9.8 meters per second. So this is your free fall acceleration. So we can plug numbers in already to this equation. It's basically 2 times 200 meters per second times the sine of 30.0 degrees divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. Oops, that's a really sloppy two. There we go. So again, we have two times the initial speed, which was 200 meters per second, times the sine of 30. So that's sine of 30. And then we divide that by 9.8 meters per second squared, and you get 20.408 and um, since we only have g to two significant figures we should probably round this off to 20. Uh, it turns out that g is more like 9.80 so we could in fact get a third significant figure assuming that these are all significant here. So we will round it off, assuming that we actually have three significant figures to work with, that this is a 9.80 and this is a 9.80. So this is 20.4 seconds. Okay, so that is the time the bullet spins in the air, t tote.
Okay, the second part was what is its maximum height? So the maximum height is basically given by delta y max. And that equation was that delta y max is equal to 3 times v naught squared, so 3 times the initial speed squared, times the sine squared of the initial angle, divided by 2 times free fall acceleration. So we have 3 times 200 meters per second squared times the sine of 30.0 degrees. This is also squared and divided by 2 times 9.80 meters per second squared. This properly actually gives us the maximum change in height. So to get the actual maximum height, you'd have to know how high up you were when you threw it from. But we can treat the point that you throw it from as 0. So we have 3 times 200 squared. And then that's times the sine of 30. So sine of 30 has to be squared as well. And then we can divide that by 2. And we can divide that by 9.8 meters per second squared. You get 1,330.6. Again, you want to round that off to only three significant figures. So this is... Uh, just to show that it is, in fact, three significant figures, we can put it in scientific notation. But it's 1,330, so that's 1 1.53 times 10 to the third uh, meters. Okay, and last but not least, how far away will it land? That's also called the range, and that is represented by delta x max. So delta x max is the x component of the speed times the total time is one way to get that. The other way, of course, is to use the equation shown on the equation sheet. So v squared times the sine of 2 times theta naught divided by the gravitational acceleration. So again, we're just making use of these three equations. Uh, we made use of this top one to get the total time. Uh, if you divide the total time by two, then you just get the time it takes to get to the top of its motion. The second one gave us the maximum height. The third one gives us the range. So plugging our numbers in here, uh, this thing becomes 200 meters per second. Then we have to square that. And then that is times the sine of 2 times 30.0 degrees, which would be 60 degrees. And then that is over 9.8 meters per second squared. So if you take 200 and you square it, you get 40,000. And then we're supposed to multiply that by the sine of 2 times 30. So 2 times 30 is 60. Oops. And we take the sine of that. You get this. And then divide that by 9.8. And you end up with 3,534.7975 blah, blah, blah. Again, round to three significant figures. This becomes 3,530. So 3,530 meters. If we want to double check any of these, we could. Uh, so let's again, this basically has answered the question. But just for fun, let's double check for example, the last one of these. So uh, double check, whoops, double check. Uh, 
delta x max. Uh, the way that you do that is that delta x max, the range, is equal to the total time times the initial speed in the x direction. And so that would be the total time times the initial speed times the cosine of the initial angle. And again, what we're making use of in this particular case is uh, using d is equal to v times t. In other words, distance traveled is speed times time when there's no acceleration in that particular direction. So we found that the total time, again, was 20.4 seconds. So t total was this. Uh, v naught, the initial speed is 200 meters, and the initial angle is 30 degrees. So what happens if we plug all those things into the calculator? Well, we get uh, 20.2. Uh, we multiply that by 200, and we multiply that by uh, the cosine of 30. So 30.0, take the cosine, you get this and you end up getting 3,498. So that's pretty close. Again, there's going to be some round off errors here. So uh, delta x max was about 3,498. So uh, 3.50 times 10 to the 3 meters. And so you can see that there's a slight discrepancy between these two, again because of round off error. But that's pretty dang close. That's within about 1%. So not bad. It means essentially that our two answers agree. You could at this point calculate a percent difference. Um, I'm I guess I could do that even though it's more something that you do in the lab. But just for fun, what's the percent difference for our double? So again, the percent difference, sometimes PD, is the first number minus the second number divided by the average of the first and second times 100%. So we would have, in this case, say 3,530 meters minus 3,000 500 meters and then that's going to be divided down here by uh, essentially 3530 meters plus uh, 3500 meters divided by 2 and all that's times 100 percent. So you can see that the top part of this is going to give us 30 and what the bottom part of this is going to give us is uh, 3515 so that means that our percent difference is 30 meters divided by if you add these two together just as a double check just to check my mental math you'd be adding these together you'd have 3530 plus 3,500, so you'd get 7,030. If you divide that by 2, you've got 3,515. So this part right here was 7,030. This part was 3,515 meters. So 3,515 meters, and there's a times 100%. So the percent difference between our two answers here, we can do, uh, I'll just start by dividing by this number. So I do that and then times 30. So this is what you get when you have 30 divided by 3,515. Now we got to multiply that by 100% and you get 0.85. So uh, basically, zero point eight
percent or 0.85 percent so I guess we should round that to 0 0.9 percent. So again these two answers agreed very nicely with you. That's all that I have for today's video and I do hope that you did find it helpful uh, at least that you found some of these examples helpful and enlightening and thanks for watching.